what's up y'all hey it's toby d and it's pound for pound atl uh, i'm filling in for me and jr tonight uh as you all very well know that have been keeping up with our live stream jr is on a cruise with his in-laws and yes they are new orleans saints fans now he will have a short moment to brag because we did beat them week 10 and we beat them without them getting a touchdown uh in that game they ended up tying the score uh, Drew Brees' jersey number, nine points. So they did not get a touchdown, and that was great. So he'll get to brag for a short little minute. Now Thanksgiving night, that is going to be a different story. And I'm hoping that we can come out with a win this time uh, because last year we were not so fortunate. My wife and I actually was debating on staying over uh, her, her family's house because they are Falcons fans, most of them. And we did stay only to watch – the Atlanta Falcons get their behinds beat on Thanksgiving night. Um, and we didn't get back here to after 12 o'clock. So hopefully this time, if we make that decision to stay, uh, there will be a turn of events and we won't have that situation. And we can actually come out with a sweeping win. And I do mean sweeping because we win this game. Of course, you all know we can bring out the brooms and sweep the Saints away regardless if they win the division or not, which it looks like they are because they're 9-2 and two right now. And it's hard to believe that they will not win at least a couple of more games uh, before the season ends. But we can possibly put a dapper on their season by hurting them in the seeding um, process. So we get this win, can make them 9-3, and three, and can really hold them tight to where we could hopefully force them on the road after their, division, after their wild card game against whomever they're going to face in the wild card round in their house so i'm hoping that can happen but we did not have a good game on sunday you all know and you watched it i know many of you were disappointed because you were hoping that we can run the table and go nine and seven and get all the help that we were going to have to pray for at the end to see if we can make it into the playoffs uh, but ladies and gentlemen that is not happening and it looks like dan quinn's job may be back on the line again after a good two-week break we shall see but i'm gonna tell y'all right now i am back on the mike mccarthy train yes i i said it i'm back on the mike mccarthy train many of you know uh that have possibly been keeping up with what may be happening in 2020 um the word is is that there will be many coaches that have coached before that may get another shot at being a head coach for another team in 2020 um, I'm hearing that Marvin Lewis is a hot name to be looking out for um, in 2020 as well. Uh, the committee has come up with a list that they had worked on after week 11 uh, of the NFL that they have sent out or are supposed to have sent out to all the owners of possible GM candidates and coaching candidates. Um, you know, like I said, there's not a lot of hot coaches out there especially offensive minded coaches out there like it has been in the past i know a lot of you have been throwing out the kansas city chiefs offensive coordinator uh don't ask me to pronounce his name because it is hard as i don't know what to pronounce and i'm not going to do it but you guys know what his name is and whom i am talking about uh but we shall see if he should land a job in 2020 after their season with kansas city chiefs is over um, but we can expect that we will possibly end up with a retread as a coach for the Atlanta Falcons. And I'm on the Mike McCarthy train. I know a lot of you have been talking about Lincoln Riley from Oklahoma, um, who came back after being down by a lot of points in the last game they just played, um, scaring themselves. But they did come back and they did get the win. I don't know if Lincoln Riley is going to be an option for the Atlanta Falcons. Um, I prefer Mike McCarthy. I think he will bring a great coaching staff here. Uh, the question will be, of course, many of you will have is a defensive minded person or as the defensive coordinator who he would choose in that role should he land the job with the Atlanta Falcons. Um, but I, I don't see Dan Quinn being here, especially after that Sunday's game, which really irked me. 
Uh, if I can see some of the things that Tampa Bay came in and, and was doing to the Atlanta Falcons, I don't understand why the coaching was not able to see some of these things. Um, you knew Shaq Barrett coming into this game, had a lot of sacks coming into this game, leading the NFL, I believe. Uh, already had about 11 sacks, and you had no answer for him. Uh, Todd Boyles was moving him all around the place, and we could not stop him. He was wearing Jake Matthews out and uh, McGarry out. No help whatsoever. And they had a bead on our cadence. I mean, you know they know Dirt Cutter. They watched film, and they saw how Matt Ryan then was making their line calls, and they was getting an early jump off the ball. And you were not running any draw plays to counteract that. And I was very upset about that. To at least try to slow that down. And go figure, you see Tampa Bay doing it. For whatever reason, if Jameis Winston could play the Atlanta Falcons 16 times out of a season, Tampa Bay would have been made the playoffs. Because every time he plays us, he kills us. Now, yes, we got two interceptions off of him. Okay, and made his interception total go up to 20 interceptions. Uh, they showed at the beginning of the game how he leads the league in turnovers since he's been in the NFL in 2015. And yet we still could not do anything with him at all. I mean, he was knocking us off like we were flies or nets. And that's embarrassing. Uh, you know you played this guy now nine times, and the first eight times you played him, you know that Jameis Winston scrambles very well on us and gets first downs on us, and you had no answer, no spy, nobody to counteract that after playing him that many times. And that is upsetting to me. Uh, the other thing is upsetting to me is just watching this team, period, and how they came out in this game. Dirt Cutter just could not seem to call anything that worked for him and Matt Ryan to really get things going. Uh, Julio Jones has a shoulder injury that ailed him the rest of the game. Now, you have to give it to him. You know Julio Jones is a tough guy, and it is hard to keep him on the sidelines. He tried hard to play with it, but you can tell he was in a lot of agony um, with that shoulder injury. Now. We don't know if he's going to play Thursday night. I have no idea, but we shall see. Am I really worried about him playing? No, because we're not going to make it to playoffs. I don't see us getting winning more than six games, to be honest with you. I just don't see it. Now, we could maybe run the table, so to speak, and go 8-8, eight and eight, but what good is 8-8 eight and eight going to do? The only thing it does is just prevent us from having a losing season. Uh, which to me, 8-8 eight eight is a losing season. I don't care how you look at it. 500, being at 500 doesn't do anything for me. And fans are upset right now, especially when you have had two great showings on the road and you come home and you stink it up just like you did when you went 1-7 and seven before your bye week. Now, they did try some things with the stunts and twists they were doing. They had some of the similar coverages they had on the back end. Here's the problem with that. They know Raheem Morris. They know he cut his teeth on Tampa 2. And you know when it's Tampa 2 because all you got to do is watch the responsibility of the linebacker. It was Deion Jones in this case. And on the one play, Deion Jones did a great job covering Chris Godwin. The problem was with that is that Chris Godwin did a better job at concentrating and catching that football because two times they went for it to knock it out and almost did, but no dice. So Chris Godwin gets himself uh, a nice touchdown, one of his two touchdowns, and 184 yards. I told y'all to look out for Chris Godwin in his third season. Guess what? The Falcons' defense contributed to him getting 1,000 yards in that game. And he wasn't the only one. Guess who else got 1,000 yards in that game? Mike Evans. Hey, and let's go back to week 10. Michael Thomas got 1,000 yards on the Atlanta Falcons. Now, do you see a connection there? Yes. That's three players, three wide receivers in the NFC South that were able to get their thousand yards 
and it came by way of the Atlanta Falcons. Now, unfortunately, our guy Julio Jones still has about 100 and some change to go before he can even get his 1,000 yards, and I don't know if he's playing to be able to do that. We know he's going to get it. Now, how many touchdowns he gets to finish the season, who knows? I was hoping he was going to get 10, but it seems like everything I've said pretty much for this year, 2019, it didn't mean anything because all of it was wrong. But, you know, hey, I'm willing to admit that everything I said was pretty much wrong about Isaiah Oliver. Yes, he has played better, but he didn't play the way that I was hoping he would play. I mean, true front, got three interceptions. But is that really saying much? Do we even know if True Fun is going to be here with the Atlanta Falcons after this season? I don't have an I don't have a clue. It's going to be a lot of changes in 2020 and ladies and gentlemen, you might as well get used to it. Because whether you want a new offensive coordinator or a defensive coordinator or a new coach or a new GM or not, I think that is going to happen. Because I don't see us going 8-8. Eight eight. I don't even know if we're going to go 6-10. Six, six and 10. But with three wins away from that, which looks like very far, considering how we came out and played on Sunday against the Tampa Bay Bucks, Two, three, and seven teams coming into the game. I have to admit, that was one of the most boring games that I've watched, which is probably why you didn't hear any fans yelling, trying to distract Jameis Winston and his offense while they were out there on the field, which typically you're supposed to do. I saw uh, a stat today. I don't know if it was uh, Matt Curalor. I think it was him that put it out, uh, one of the Falcons content creators. Dan Quinn is 19 and 18 at home since being the Atlanta Falcons head coach. I remember when there was a time where teams were intimidated to come here in any of our houses to play us. Them days are gone. And unless we get someone who can help reestablish that, there's not a team or coach out there that's going to be scared when they come in here. It's going to be like a home game to them, which it has been since Dan Quinn has been the head coach. Hopefully one day we can reestablish the intimidation we once had at home. I don't know who's going to do it, but it would be nice to know that you can at least win here when you can't win anywhere else. You got eight games here. But – we don't have those days right now. We shall see if those days will soon return. But I don't know if we had too high of expectations like Scott Pioli was saying. Um, another thing I heard him saying, even though he didn't say specifically whom he was talking about, uh, he was asked about the use of analytics in football. And we know analytics go a long ways back. A lot of teams use analytics to – um, judge the draft as far as the players in the draft free agency and all those things and making roster moves for the team and he was saying sometimes it's difficult dealing with certain people when all they want to do is look at the tape when they have a debate with you about a player or players and all I can think about is Dan Quinn because he would always say if him and Thomas Dimitrov had issues about Drafting a player, a free agent player, he always wanted to go to the tape. And that was funny because it sounds like to me, and it's just pure speculation, there's no facts here, that Scott Pioli was not in agreement with a lot of the moves that they made signing certain players and Dan Quinn having control of the 53-man roster. And it's going to be interesting to see if Arthur Blank is going to allow another head coach to come in with that type of control, or is he going to go back to the traditional way of allowing the GM to be the guy to control all of that and to hire the head coach. It's going to be interesting to see if that goes down when this season is over. But until then, guys, we need to prepare ourselves for the end of the year press conference by Arthur Blank and whomever else is going to speak before the new coach is hired or new GM for that matter uh, because that's where we're at right now and if you're still in denial about that then I don't know what to tell you but I'm there so other than that I don't have any more to say we'll see 
what this team becomes in 2020. And right now, I'm rooting for the 49ers. I know y'all are mad at me right now because that's Kyle Shanahan's team. And some of you are still hot at him about that Super Bowl. But I'm going with anybody that can possibly stop the New Orleans Saints from going to the Super Bowl. And if they should happen to get to the Super Bowl, the Ravens is my top choice to beat them on um, the way that Lamar Jackson and that defense over there is playing. So, hey, other than that, man, y'all comment down below. Please subscribe. Let me know if you feel like maybe us as fans and Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov may have expected more than what this team really is. Uh, hey, as of right now, I'm Toby D, pound for pound ATL. And as always, as JR and myself would say, 